The idea that I could make like, a fully realized song like by myself in my house was just like revolutionary. To me, music was always going to be like a cool pastime thing. I never ever thought that. this would be my job. It's like That's crazy. it still sometimes like makes no sense to me. And so I was like, Dad. I want to be just like you. I'm going to go to graphic design school. He's like, the fuck are you doing? Are you insane? Why? Like, I, he was just like, don't do that, dude. I got hired with my graduating portfolio Damn. at like a big ad agency. And so I was like 20. <laughs> oh man, Jacques yeah. Green, like traditional French Canadian name, <laughs> classic English last name. Like, yeah. That's me. I signed my first record to my friend without him knowing it was me. Yeah. Like only, well, I mean, like very quickly I was like, oh dude, by the way, it's me. The amount of people who I, I even consider friends will be like, oh Jacques, how you doing? And I'm like, oh. dude, you know that's not my name. Coming into a sense of responsibility while still be being in such proximity to a world that feels so inconsequential is mm -hmm. like very, uh, very confusing at times. Hi, so today I'm here with Jacques Green. Hey, what's up? <laughs> So you were, was it born in Montreal? I was, yeah. Were your parents born there as well, or? Uh, my mom was born there. My mom is like as French Canadian as it gets. Mm -hmm. uh, in the East End. Yeah. And my dad was actually born in New Jersey, but grew up in Montreal. And oh. Like, yeah. So that's why I speak English. Because like really like from kind of the part of the city I'm in and my mom, like otherwise I'd be just like a French speaking yeah. person. Yeah. How do you describe yourself back then growing up? back then mm -hmm. uh <laughs> like teenage years teenage years awkward years uh, <laughs> awkward i years. like i had like an emo phase mm -hmm. um loved 50 cent and eminem yeah th and the red hot chili peppers very odd like <laughs> very kind of mainstream kid i guess until uh until i like found electronic music oh, when wow. i was like 15 yeah and then all of a sudden like I don't know, like me and like two friends who were the only other people who knew what like Aphex Twin was. Yeah, were, wasn't like, it your history teacher who showed you that? Yeah, yeah, literally. So I was just like, I was like loved music, but like was very much like, I don't know, any random kid. Yeah. Um, were you into school? Only in the sense that like, I was like good at school, mm -hmm. so I didn't have to like care that much. Oh wow. Like it was like very like, being quite lucky at just kind of acing an exam or whatever without really Damn. putting in much work. So like, I didn't love it, but I loved that like it wasn't like a huge stress. I, I think I was the kind of kid like that got along with everyone, but mm -hmm. wasn't like, didn't have like super many like friends, but like no one was like, yo, fuck that guy. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? I'm yeah. like, I think, uh, yeah, kind of like floated around mm -hmm. different social circles and tried to be like friendly to people. What were your favorite subjects back then? Damn, uh, definitely like art class. I got really mm -hmm. big into like developing film and shit like oh. that. I like, spent all my lunch breaks like taking like really bad black and white photos of like <laughs> a puddle. <laughs> and then like being in the dark room oh my a God. lot. Um, classic. I think I really liked French and English class. Like mm -hmm. I liked reading a lot. Yeah. But all the grammar part, especially French is like a terrible language. It's like really too complicated for its own good. Mm -hmm. There's like, all the conjugation and stuff yeah. like that, like the spelling is really hard. So that like that part was not <laughs> yeah. not of any interest, but like any kind of reading that we did like was like, oh, like I don't know, reading like fiction for school is so much nicer than like pouring through like an algebra book. Yeah. For me. Um, yeah. What kind of music did your parents play in the house when you were growing up? Uh my mom, like to this day, basically only listens to like Beck and like the Talking Heads. <laughs> That's like her, and like I guess like a little bit of like Lauren Hill or what, you know, like <laughs> the odd Erica yeah. Badu Lauren Hill kind of like <laughs> like soulful grown woman music, yeah. and then like uh, classic like Generation X mm -hmm. sort of you know, yeah. Beck Beck was like I I distinctly remember like the tape cassettes for Odile and Mellow Gold being like the mainstays in her car. Damn. Yeah. And my dad like he was really into like Tom Waits and like Bob Dylan like kind of you know like mm -hmm. American yeah. rock singer songwriters and then like he had a whole period there where he listened to like almost exclusively Dave Matthews band which <laughs> like you know God bless him. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god that's so funny. <laughs> So before you started doing bands, how did you pick up an instrument? I went to a high school that was like 
sort of a shitty public high school, but it, its one redeeming factor was that it had these, like, um, disciplines. Like, it wasn't just, like, you know, you, so you, there was, like, a ballet program, like, a music mm-hmm. program. Um, and I was never in the music program, but, like, my first girlfriend was, and, mm-hmm. like, all, like, a lot of my friends were, like, the kids in there. So, like, I kind of, like, picked stuff along the way, and then I studied, studied. I took, like, blues mm-hmm. and jazz guitar lessons for, like, oh, wow. five years. And so my musical background was like improv and like scales oh, wow. and like jazz and blues guitar yeah and then and then i was like in a couple like like rock bands or whatever but mm-hmm. by the time i found out what like being a producer was and that you can make music by yourself and yeah. not have to like argue with someone about like what yeah. the drum part should be like never looked back yeah <laughs> like like the moment that happened i think i was like 16 i just like saved up a summer and bought like a shitty little mpc and like the idea that i could make a fully realized song like by myself in my house was just like revolutionary Mm -hmm. and so yeah that's that's that how many bands would you say you were in mainly just one and then there was like kind of rotation of like a few different members or whatever and we do like kind of one-off shows or whatever for the producing how did you do you just teach yourself that yeah yeah like I guess, so I was like 15, 16, that's like 2004, 2005, Mm -hmm. and I feel like that was like the golden era of like message boards, you know? Mm -hmm. Because it was before before Facebook. I feel like Facebook kind of killed off the message board in a way that I find really sad. I like, I love that there was all these specific, like when I got into like gear, there was like one message board where like, you know, every question you've ever asked has like been asked. So you just like search for like, how do I do that? And then you like kind of like plug it into Google and you like find like a 16 page conversation of people that have like figured out how to do Whoa. it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, there was one called Dubstep Forum <laughs> back in the day. Oh my God. That had a, a big like production kind of like, you know, people like asking each other questions, recommending each other like synths, like virtual yeah. synths and like, yeah, just like, so just through that, like yeah. anytime I had a question, anytime I hit a wall, it's just like, oh shit, I'll just like look it up. Yeah. Were the you, internet taught me. Were you in, was it school with Lunas? Uh, yeah, like after high school. We have a oh. thing in Quebec, like, like in the part of Canada I'm from, there's this thing kind of like between high school and university. Yeah. Uh, and it's called Sejep. And mm-hmm. so Lunas and I were at the same one. I was studying graphic design and he was studying like something in cinema. Oh. Yeah. Did you always wanted to study graphic design, not music? Yeah, yeah, I was like, to me, music was always going to be like a cool pastime thing. I never, ever thought that this would be my job. It's like, <laughs> it still sometimes like makes no sense to me. Really? It's, yeah. Why? I, well, A, I mean, I came up like, I remember using Napster and Kazaa <laughs> and LimeWire like more yeah. than like buying CDs and oh tapes and shit. So like the idea of becoming a musician in an era where people stopped buying music is like, mm. I, I'm really, really thankful I can, like, pay my rent with this shit. I guess the idea of being a full-time artist was never, like, a... Not that I wasn't ambitious. Like, I was ambitious in, like, anything I've ever undertaken. Mm-hmm. But, like, that somehow seemed, like, too far-fetched to be real kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But, hey, here I am. Yeah. Quit my day job, like, six or seven years ago. Damn. And, like, still doing this. Um, was going to school and studying graphic design something that you want to do? Yeah. Or like your parents oh, man. wanted no, you I to was... get like a degree. Uh, no, my my dad was like, "Don't do that." <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, because I he... mean, like school in general. Uh, like, would you have like gone straight into doing something else? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I still think I maybe should have gone to university, mm-hmm. but fuck it. Yeah. Um. Yeah, my dad worked in advertisement oh. as like an art director, and basically he went to like a very similar program, and then started working mm-hmm. right away and worked like forever yeah and so i was like dad i want to be just like you i'm gonna go to graphic design school he's like the fuck are you doing are you insane why like, i he was just like don't do that dude like i've been working so hard like don't do that <laughs> and but i did it anyways yeah. and um wait what does your mom do she's she was a production like man like a project manager at an ad agency like they met oh in, they met in the ad world um and now she like works at a little boutique yeah. in montreal so right after you finished that school, you went right into like art directing too? Yeah, like I thought I was maybe going to go to university, but I got hired with my graduating portfolio Damn. at like a big ad agency. And so I was like 20 
I was like 20 working at this like massive ad agency. I was younger than like the receptionist. I was the youngest person in the yeah. building and like working as an art director. So like <laughs> I totally like underqualified <laughs> and just like making like Mazda billboards and yeah. being like, oh yeah, no, the car needs to be bigger. Like just yeah. <laughs> like definitely kind of uh, um yeah, getting away with murder. And I did that uh, I did that for a while until like one of my first records started doing well mm. kind of online. And I was using like all my vacation time to go like tour. Yeah. And then I was like, I don't know, I feel like this is happening right now. Like I could maybe go back to a design job later, but like mm -hmm. I feel like the fire's kinda catching. Like what if I don't do this and I never know? Yeah. So I just quit that job and like went on tour and that's it. Like yeah. that's just what I do still today. So. Do you know how that song gained momentum? Did you push it out? Like uh, literally stuff? no, it just like got picked up by DJs and stuff. Like in fact I think I probably did everything wrong and like didn't it could have gotten bigger. It was like that Another Girl song, mm -hmm. which is probably still my biggest record. Um, like Pete Tong started playing it. It just like, yeah. it actually just kind of like spread like wildfire. I should have done, like, we don't even have a video for it. Like still yeah. now, like it, it, it was uh, not a fluke. Cause I think it's just because it was a good record, but yeah. I didn't like push it or like, there wasn't even like the concept of like buying ads on social media, I think didn't even really exist at that point. So like, no, I didn't work it as much as I should have. Did you always have this name or did you go under a different like moniker? Um, yeah, I had another moniker. Like when I threw parties with Lunas, I made music as Hopatron, mm -hmm. which was like much more like hip hop. Like I was kind of doing like instrumental rap beats. Yeah. And like kind of, you know, more closer actually to like what Lunas makes. Like yeah. we were, we had like kind of like similar kind of vibes and sounds. Mm -hmm. And I always like kind of liked House and Techno, but was much more of like a rap kid. Yeah. And then, I don't know, at some point like started making a bit of dance music. Yeah. And obviously it kind of felt too far from what I was doing. So I was like, oh, let's get a new name. There's like an intersection close to the agency where I worked. There was an intersection of St. Jacques and Green Avenue. Oh. And as I told you before, like my mom's Francophone and my dad's Eng 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 Anglophone. So I was yeah. like, Oh man, Jacques yeah. Green, like traditional French Canadian name, <laughs> classic English last name. Like, yeah, that's me, and that was that. Was, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Why do you choose not to use your original name, like your personal name? My real name is way too long and way too French, so I feel like saying Philippe Aubin Dion every time I would like do anything. Yeah. I still like. Every time I even have to sign a form, like I curse the fact that my parents both put my, oh their my last God. names on my name. <laughs> had to. Oh my God, that's so funny. <laughs> so like, yeah, I, well actually I used the fake name also because I wanted to get honest feedback about my new music from mm. my friends. And I feel like if you just show your music to your friends, it's always yeah. like, oh yeah, this is like pretty cool. Yeah. Like you never get like honest feedback. Yeah. So I was able to like email the MP3s to like friends of mine and just be like, Yo, this kid Jacques just sent me a yeah. bunch of tracks. Like, you mind checking them out? I, I feel like they're kind of good, but like, I wanted like, yeah. what do you think? And and then like, yeah. Yeah, you also did that to like labels or something, right? Yeah, like, yeah. I managed. Stuff. I signed my first record to my friend without him knowing it was me. Yeah. Like only. Well, I mean, like very quickly, I was like, oh, dude, by the way, it's me. But like, what was their reaction? He's like, damn. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, it, like it was it was fairly early, but yeah, I sent him the MP3s. And he was like, oh, like, do you mind putting me in touch with this guy? And I just, like, made, like, a Jacques Green, like, Gmail account. Yeah. And I was like, hey, heard you're into this. And oh, then my God. Like, but then by, like, the second reply, I was just like, oh, by the way, like, it's, it's me. I'm glad you like this stuff. <laughs> when you show your music to friends, mm -hmm. there's always going to be, like, even if, dude, I've had friends show me their stuff and, like, I hate everything, but I'll be like, yo, that hi-hat's cool. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? You'll, you'll oh. find, like, only the good thing to say about it. Like, yeah. Because there's no way to gently like, yeah. bruise someone's ego like that. Do you think you would still do that if you were starting out now? Like this tactic? Do you recommend it? Yeah, totally. Uh, yeah, I think uh, a little fraud never hurt anyone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it, also, like, well, making music by myself, like, the idea of having, like, a crazy name, like, you know, like, I, I don't... Like, band names are so, like, epic, and, like, yeah. when producer names are, like, by themselves, and they still have, like, some big-ass, like carnage like just yeah. like, it feels like I'm not I don't feel like a superhero so mm -hmm. like having like a big superhero type alter ego name yeah doesn't feel like it makes sense for me mm -hmm. uh, 
I'm kind of annoyed now because at this point, like, the amount of people who I, I even consider friends will be like, oh, Jacques, how you doing? And I'm oh. like, dude, you know that's not my name. Yeah. Bro. Like, <laughs> what are you doing? And that, that's always, like, a little obnoxious. <laughs> yeah. So if I were to start over again, also, I wouldn't pick a French-Canadian name that is really simple and obvious to me, but that no one seems to know how to pronounce or spell correctly. Oh. So... That's that's a good one. Mar marketability, <laughs> like you know, I should have gone for like Paul or so. You know, oh some, some shit you can't mess up. Since when did Rick Owens become your main inspiration? Uh, back in design school, before oh, I knew wow. I was gonna make music. So like, I was like nineteen, twenty, with no money, like didn't have any yeah. at all. But I've always found his, like even my my kind of love and respect for him goes as far as like. There's even, like, there's quite a lot of his clothes that I don't like. Mm -hmm. or, is, or at least they're definitely not for me. But I have so much respect for how, like, singular the vision is. Yeah. And, like, he's still majority owner of his company. I love that. And then the vertical integration of how his stuff is made. Like, owning his factories in Italy. Sourcing fabri fabric yeah. blends that just don't exist. Mm -hmm. Uh living on top of a studio that's on top yeah. of like the showroom there's like a dedication to control of his quality and control of his world mm -hmm. that i find so inspiring and like intense and dedicated and i really yeah i like that there's no fucking half measures it's like the world of rick is that and it, it's beautiful to see him yeah. and his wife michelle just like yeah, it's it, it, anyone that's able to have such an uncompromising personal vision and scale it up to that size because mm -hmm. he's a massive company. He's yeah. making so much money, yeah. but like in a way that is very rarely bends like too much towards like the commercial. That's true. Like yeah. he'll make the odd like wearable T-shirt, but most of his shit is fucking extreme. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's like beautiful to me that someone has managed to be so successful with with that. Yeah. And to be so true to his vision, like, you look at the shows today to what he was doing 20 years ago, it hasn't, like, changed that much, hmm. or 15 yeah. years ago. Or how did you decide to start your own imprint? Uh, there was, like, a bunch of my friends making great music that they couldn't sign anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I've always been really involved in, like, the artwork for my records. And it kind of felt cool to, like, maybe... I don't know, help other people have fully realized versions of their projects yeah. and like help them out like that. It ended up being like, we've, we've had the little label dormant now for like two years. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we'll like bring it back at any point. It kind of feels like to build up the momentum again is like yeah. so much work. Why, why did it's, it become dormant? Um, just like, because I started working on my album. And oh, honestly, yeah. like the idea of maybe fumbling someone else's project because I was too busy on my own mm, yeah. felt like very disrespectful to someone else's work. So yeah. I wanted to like, chill on it and just like not half-ass anyone else's record and also not half-ass my own so I could like actually focus on something yeah and then by the time the dust settled a little I was like oh shit we haven't released something in like a year and a half like it doesn't make sense to like mm. jump back in or like I don't know so for now I'm not doing it yeah it's also so much work mm -hmm. and so much work of it is like not creative right like chasing down a review and like oh, uploading true. mp3s to like the distributor like yeah <laughs> stuff that like doesn't really speak to me mm -hmm. um it's why i love working with like labels like lucky me so they can do that for my yes. records <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, um, yeah I'd, I'd much rather spend the time like just going over to the friend's house and like hear the damn like the music they're working on than like yo let's work really hard and possibly like lose a lot of money on this coming out like, yeah. <laughs> And you've always been interested in, uh, like, scoring films, right? Yeah, I'd love to do it. I've been speaking to some friends who work in that field about hopefully getting into it. I love sound design. It's, like, one of my, one of the most fun parts of making music is, like, trying to come up with my own sounds. And, mm -hmm. uh, I feel like film is such a beautiful application of something like that because, I don't know, like, setting the mood for a scene, that's so great. Yeah. yeah. It's awesome. How do you think you've grown as a person since when you started making music? I've grown much more responsible and aware of responsibilities and commitment and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But also, it's very weird to like become fully like an adult in a world that feels like perpetual like 
youth. Yeah. <laughs> like, the, the club world is so yeah. extremely, like, disconnected from uh, the world in many ways. And in a way that's, like, kind of irresponsible at times. So, yeah, so coming into a sense of responsibility while still be being in such proximity to a world that feels so inconsequential is, mm-hmm. like, very... Uh, very confusing at times, yeah. but I I still love it. I love club culture and yeah. the club <laughs> and like all that shit. It's it's really great, but it's interesting to kind of like grow a little o- older, not so much wiser, <laughs> and just, and still be in proximity to it. Yeah. Um. Yeah. It's kind of weird. The weirdest thing about all this mm-hmm. is like music used to be a release mechanism and like mm-hmm. kind of therapeutic, and when it becomes your day job and like your source of income that like release is gone because it's now like a source of stress instead of a source yeah. of like stress release um and that's like a weird thing to grapple with but luckily i don't know luckily i i'm able to keep my work and like pace of life in a way where uh i like enjoy tremendously like making music mm-hmm. and i enjoy so much like having a few weeks off the road and like going into my studio every day and just like trying shit out is like so rewarding still and I still like discover new things yeah still make new shit so like that's so exciting and then by the time I get like really anxious or like start hitting kind of creative walls in the studio I have like this other side of my job that allows me to like travel and like go play it for people yeah so it's cool I don't think I'll get tired of it anytime soon Mm mm-hmm which is good last question what do you want to be remembered for? Oh my god. I don't know if I have that like big sense of like ego and legacy. Like mm-hmm. I'd like to be remembered for being like a kind person to my friends. Yeah. And like trying to make people feel good, I guess. <laughs> like uh, I think the best part of DJing and releasing records is is doing stuff that can touch someone and make anything better. So like honestly like yeah, I'd love to be remembered, I guess. Uh, by some people who are like, oh man, yeah, that record really helped me through something. Or like, mm-hmm. damn, that night we met, that was at a Jacques Green show. Like, yeah. so glad I met you. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. I'd love to be remembered by connotations to good moments in people's lives. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Of course, thanks. Bye.